Hello, welcome to Apps and Bros, and this week it's the second part of our deep dive on Flanders Red. And it's a special one because, yes, as promised last week, we're diving deeper into one of our favorite Flanders Red, Rouge de Mekinac. Roll the intro. For an open window on a crappy world Max and Chris from Ups and Bros guys are long times fans of the show you will know that one of my favorite beers ever was from a then small brewery called a la fu uh it was an awesome beer it was a, a beer that was barrel aged but also a wild fermentation in some ways and then all blended together very unique i've never really had a beer like that since uh, so i still dream about it most nights anyways that then small brewery kept in touch with us we, we they're now good friends of the show you know we talk with them on a uh, semi-regular basis, at least when they have something cool happening, uh, which is the case of this current beer. Now, they're not quite as small as they used to be, and now they have one of the coolest collaborating, collaboration, collaborating beer uh, in, in Quebec, but in also, I think, a lot of different places in the industry. It's something that's very, very different that I don't think I've seen before. Uh, usually collaborations go in a very, very specific way that I'll, I'll touch on later, but they kind of broke the mold there. They did something very, very different. They took one of their iconic beers, the Rouge de Mekinac, and decided to do custom blends with a bunch of high-profile Quebec breweries. Um, Awesome concept, I'll talk about it a little later, but before we get started on this week's video, a little word from our sponsors at My Brew HQ. If you guys haven't heard about them yet and you've been watching the channel, trying to get yourself into home brewing or just brewing in general, they are the perfect resource for you to buy stuff online to upgrade your setup or just to get started in home brewing, whether it's ingredients, equipment, or you'd like to get started in making cider, mead, or beer, it's a fantastic way to support a local business here in Canada, but also to just get your stuff online without having to get in line to purchase your stuff. So if you go on their website, fill out your cart and do your first ever purchase using the code BROS, you get a 10% off your first purchase, which is fantastic. And also a great way by clicking the link down there in the description to support the channel. Because yeah, it's a pretty cool partnership that we have and we're super proud to have them on the show supporting this fantastic project. Thanks a lot, my British Q, and let's jump into the video. So Chris, being our resident marketing expert, why is this collaboration so awesome? So marketing is a pretty, pretty steep subject in general. When we talk about beer, it's not something that we bring up often, but me and Max have a big background in marketing. We both studied advertising and that's how we met and that's how we got started making beer videos. And branding was always something that we look forward into, maybe talk more, but never really add the opportunity to put it forward in our videos because we always want to put the beer forward and not uh, what made the beer sell at the first part. But this week, we want to dive a little bit more deeper into the marketing behind Flanders Red in general. And there's no better ways to do that by bringing along a classic, which is Rodenbach. We discussed about them, their history, and how they were important for the style back in the days when they all started. But Rodenbach also make their beer shine so hard on the shelves that it's a yearly staple for any beer geeks around the world. When they look around, Rodenbach is easy to find. And how easy it is. So yes, by using very strong symbols, like that big, big R in their logo, with a black letter typography makes it shines. It makes it bold, but also has that little hint of classic through it with the typography and that big red R is fantastic. It's phenomenal. It shines by itself. You can see that big red R anywhere and the good point is in the thumbnail, I'm using a similar big bold R and you can easily connect it to the R from Rodenbach. And this is the key to their branding. And they know it because they use it in every single variations of their beers, including the classic Grand Cru or legendary beers that are all wrapped in gold plastic with the top up there 
corked and all that. It it just makes it extra special. Has some sort of VIP feel when you find that bottle, and it's golden. You you have that. You can give it as a Christmas gift or just a gift in general because it looks like a jewelry, not like a beer. And even further as looking as bottle of champagne, which is very famous. It has some sort of notoriety through it that will bring maybe new buyers into, oh, I'm gonna try this golden beer. It, it, looks, it looks fancy, it has that nice appeal, and it shines through all their different bottles they're releasing. But how to connect that with Alafu? It's good friends from us. Um, they're located in Saint Sid. If you don't know, Saint Sid is also the town hosting one of North America's biggest country festival, and you can see it from Alafu's branding. They have this barrel-like Western typography. Also, um, switching their name for Alafu China when it's related to barrels, and you can see it in every single bottle. They're bottling in smaller bottles now, which I think it's fantastic because it makes it an easier purchase when you're faced with a big 750. Sometimes it's a little bit more expensive for a beer that's maybe sour and barrel aged and that you're not sure if you're gonna enjoy it. And it's perfect for beginners. You can easily jump into a bottle like this, enjoy it, and go back to purchase another one. But what's really fantastic about Alephru's branding is how everything is homogeneous together. I'm not sure if I just invented a word, but you have nice tones of brown and that cool beige paper-like texture in the back, which just makes it like a, an old map, an old branded paper that you got from that Western times. And you can easily see cowboy boots, uh, sheriff stars around there, dessert likes uh, props and you see it, it's right there. And he always use that same sort of illustrations that's and drown. Same artist on every single label. And why is that? Because it, again, it brings an homogeneous brand through all their different beers because they're making different ones. They're not like Rodenbach doing only their Flanders Red and a few variations of this one. They have the Rouge de Mekinac, they have canned IPAs, they have Fantastic Sours. It's all blended together into one brand, but it does stand out when it's on different shelves of beer stores, which is the key right here. And the Rouge de Mekinac in those smaller bottles with a cork on top and the little cage is just perfect. And the beer itself is just a fantastic beer. And also the cork used on the bottle. Yes, it makes it a little bit more fancier when you sit down at the table with your friends and you have this court cage that you're popping up and people are always impressed. Like it, whether it's like a $8 sour or 20 bucks Lambic, it always has that nice same feel. People are like, oh, you're you're popping out that corked bottle. It's the same thing with uh, Fins Mom from Unibru. It has a cork top and it always has that classic signature and people are always impressed when you bring out that big boy, that big bottle with the cork. It, it has a nice signage, but also it's useful. It makes it a lot more easier if you want to age it because it has a better sealed up thing. Please make sure to put it sideways so this way it stays wet the whole time and doesn't dry off. If they're sitting on a few bottles, it's a perfect way to age your beers. So Max, any second thoughts on this and the marketing wise and doing collabs like that? I think it's fantastic and you have a few more details for us, right? All right, so as promised, this is how a typical collaboration within the craft beer industry works. Uh, you basically have two brewer friends that decide they want to do something together. Now, they may or may not go tell their marketing team and their higher-ups that they want to do this. Uh, sometimes they just decide they do it, and then the marketing team has to last-minute go and, and make a product out of it. The brew day typically goes like this, where the host brewery is going to do most of the work. They will all, the guest and the host brewery, drink some beers, talk, reminisce about whatever, talk about their brewing techniques and how things are going and what they do specifically, hoping to share knowledge to be able to better themselves in the end. Uh, the uh, guest brewery will typically do the mash out, which means they will you know, take care of all the grain that's in the mash tun. And that's pretty much the extent of their work. They might collaborate on the recipe. Well, they generally will collaborate on the recipe and generally on the brew day that will 
will change because one grain won't be there or one hop won't be available. So they're going to have to improvise, which is generally what they do. Now, this collaboration, why it's awesome and why it's very different than your typical collaboration, there's, there's, there's none of that. There's no uh, sharing recipes or brewing together, which you would think is negative. No, in this case, it's positive because you're cutting all the bullshit and you're going directly to the tasting, to the brew, to the, the uh, sorry, the drinking. Uh, so this particular collaboration is basically one base beer, the Rouge Mikinak, blended with beers from the collaborating breweries. And naturally, that uh, end result has been collaborated with. So they both drank it and went, this is pretty good. Let's do use this percentage of these barrels and whatnot. Very, very atypical. Doesn't generally happen that way. And especially with one particular brand or one particular beer. So you're taking the Rouge Mikinak, which is an iconic beer that you don't necessarily want to mess around with, and then you are purposefully messing around with it with exterior products to create something very unique. Uh, so every single bottle that we have uh, are, are, are naturally a different brewery, but also have a very, very distinct character from it. Not only that, but the breweries uh, that are collaborated with also have access to some of Adafu's barrels to be able to do their own version of it on their side. Awesome collaboration. As a brewer, that is the way that I would want it to go, especially when it has uh, barrels involved with it. Uh, and the fact that the breweries that they have selected uh, were able to come in and add their own twist to it is pretty phenomenal. A lot of the breweries have not been doing a lot of collaboration in the last couple of years. So that's why this collaboration, the specific collaboration, is very atypical, but it's very awesome. It's very cool, and especially for our friends at Adafu to see them really enter that craft beer mindset and create something very unique, very collaborative. Awesome. I, I've got nothing negative to say about it. I'm very happy for them, very happy to have access to this beer. And uh, if you have a chance, definitely check it out. Go either to St. Sit or uh, get your hands on one of those bottles. Uh, it's going to be worth it. It is worth it. So thanks again for watching. I hope you guys love this second part of the Flanders Red series. We have two more parts coming up for the month of June. I hope you're excited. Um, coming up, barrel bacterias. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll be geeking out on geeking, geeking out on this one.